Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to um, this panel, which uh, I think may uh, develop a few sparks as we go along here, if, uh, if we're, I've got my thinking cap on right here. I want to thank Terry for inviting me. This is my first World Policy Conference, so I want to thank him for inviting me to what has been a very interesting experience. We heard a lot of uh, interesting remarks all the way along the line, and um, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for this panel on the consequences of Trump. Let's see how far we can get before we get as divided as the American political scene is these days. Um, and um, I, you know, it seems uh, from the first few days here at, uh, at Marrakesh that uh, we've been talking around a subject that we're now gonna talk about directly. It's the, the elephant in the room. Uh, and when I say elephant, uh, I mean, anyone? Oh. Yeah, <laughs> you got it, Virginia. It's uh, Donald Trump, and I didn't have to say it then. He's always been sort of the orange-haired specter behind uh, each one of these uh, panels. We hear the, the impact he's having around the world, and so I think this morning it'll be interesting for us to see if we can analyze that impact a little bit. As I reflected on the subject, I thought, well, maybe I should look at this sort of geographically. You know, um, when you look at it a geographic frame, where has Trump had some kind of impact? What, where are there some consequences of his three-year-old presidency? Well, it's just like everywhere. Chinese trade war, decoupling, uh, India, the way that the Modi was encouraged to go after uh, Kashmir. Uh, in Syria, what we see, we're witnessing happening right now uh, in Syria um, and putting American armed forces uh, in jeopardy along the way uh, with Iran, the JCPOA, uh, Saudi Arabia, more weapons and, and uh, American soldiers on their way, American mercenaries, maybe I should say, on their way. Um, Israel, the way Netanyahu has been inspired and Trump's son-in-law has come up with a rather one-sided Middle East peace pro uh, plan. Um, in Europe, the encouragement for Brexit. Um, in Europe, the way you discourage NATO. Uh, in Europe, the encouragement of populism. So everywhere you look, and you, go, you include South America for that, you know, Mexico and Canada, uh, NAFTA, Japan and the threats of tariffs, North Korea, South Korea, you know, you name it. Everywhere you look, uh, there's something, there's been some effect from Trump. Uh, as Thierry uh, mentioned at the, in his opening remarks here, you see the shadow of the White House everywhere. So we have panelists from everywhere who I think uh, will be able to let us know about what they see as some of the consequences of Trump. Um, we have Reynold Girard, who is the esteemed senior reporter and a war correspondent for Le Figaro in Paris, my colleague. Uh, Moto Shigo Ito, who uh, Moto is, is uh, uh, on the uh, Japanese uh, Council on Economic and Fiscal Policy, and he is uh, known well in Japan as the father of Abenomics. We have, uh, next is uh, Jean-Claude Gouffa, who's my colleague on the American Hospital Board in Paris, and uh, he described himself the other day as a French banker in the United States and an American banker in France, who does both. Um, uh, Joseph Joffe from uh, Die Zeit, uh, the publisher and editor of the Zeit. Um, and who else? Uh, we've got um, uh, Lin Chao, uh, Lin being the um, uh, uh, Chinese representative here on the panel. Uh, he is the vice chairman and secretary general of the Shanghai Development Research Foundation, which is an independent Chinese think tank. And finally, at the end, last but not least, John Sawyer, who is uh, uh, and on the uh, Newbridge Advisory Council. He's the executive chairman of the uh, Newbridge Ad Ad uh, Advisory Council and a senior advisor at Chatham House. And more importantly, perhaps, he's the former uh, head of intelligence, British intelligence, MI6. So uh, we have a pretty complete panel. And we decided at lunch yesterday, we had such an interesting lunch, we were so taken with our lunchtime conversation that we decided we would try to keep up the, our brilliant remarks for you today and kind of approach this panel somewhat differently. So I have asked each of our panelists to summarize in three words the first three years of Trump 
uh, what their impressions are, what they would say, how would they react in just three words. So, Renaud, your three words, please. Uh, en trois mots seulement, uh, après trois ans de Trump, quelles conséquences on a sur le monde, eh bien, on a un rapprochement euh, inouï entre la Russie et la Chine. OK. Moto. Yeah, I just like to just emphasize only one thing uh, about what I call the globalization dilemma, trilemma. Tri I mean, the globalization and democracy and uh, sovereign, national sovereignty. The three are very much related and may, may be very convenient way to look at what happened now. Okay, John Clark. Uh, Jim, I give you two versions. You pick the one you want. <laughs> the first one is uh, unpredictable, erratic, versatile. That's the individual. Mm -hmm. And then on the policy side, a c very consequential presidency. Very consequential presidency. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you can explain that a little later on. Joseph. <coughs> in, <coughs> in French, plus ça change, meaning there's a lot more continuity, continuity between Trump and his predecessor, Obama, than meets the eye, and that will continue even if we have a democratic administration in 1921. Edward Shaw. Uh, three words I want to choose is the first one is ignorant in foreign trade and a global supply chain. Second is stubborn, or you may call persistent. The last one is unpredictable. Unpredictable. Yeah. Okay. And John, the view uh, from Britain. Uh, well, it's not so much a view from Britain, it's a view <laughs> from me, but it's, um, uh, I think the first striking thing about Trump is his approach to business and his deregulating style. Uh, I think we should, um, acknowledge that as a significant shift from his predecessors. So deregulating is the first. The second, and you've described it, uh, his approach to the world is disruptive. And the third, I think you have to say, is he's damaging. He's damaging to the, the, the global public good. Mm -hmm. All in all, I would say kind of a negative assessment of the uh, Trump three years. There are a few maybe positives in there. I could see maybe a few positive signs, but uh, not particularly positive for Mr. Trump. I don't know how many Trump voters we have <coughs> on the panel, but uh, in any case, so let me just begin the discussion and feel free to jump in and disagree with each other and that sort of thing. But I wanna begin with Renault here to ask him uh, because his president, Mr. Macron, has made a thing of being the Trump whisperer. He's the person who seems to be the only world leader who can get along with Trump. Um, and I guess the question is, uh, how has he managed to do that, but also, what has he gotten back from Mr. Trump in return for this, uh, uh, this his attitude towards the United States? Uh, je suis tout à fait d'accord avec ce que vient de dire Jim, c'est-à-dire que Macron, en fait, selon moi, a eu l'intelligence de comprendre que Trump était très sensible au rapport personnel, il ne lisait pas beaucoup les, les notes qu'on lui faisait, très sensible aux explications directes entre euh, dirigeants. Et ça, il l'a bien compris. Euh, et cet aspect particulier de la personnalité de Trump euh, peut avoir des conséquences euh, néfastes. On l'a vu euh, lors d'une conversation téléphonique qu'il a eue le 6 octobre euh, dernier avec euh, le président turc Erdogan, où le président turc a réussi à, lui, à obtenir de lui un feu vert pour envahir le nord euh, de la Syrie. Mais avec Macron, je pense que ça marche. Je pense qu'au euh, départ, évidemment, euh, ça a un peu patiné, mais on ne peut pas évidemment faire changer intégralement euh, les convictions de Trump, qui sont très, très fortes depuis toujours. Euh, donc ça n'a pas marché euh, sur euh, le climat, ça n'a pas marché au départ sur le JCPOA, sur l'Iran, sur l'accord nucléaire euh, sur l'Iran, Macron n'est pas parvenu à faire, à faire revenir en arrière Trump. Mais euh, en revanche, je pense qu'en maintenant cette relation personnelle, qui a commencé par un déjeuner à la Tour Eiffel, euh, il a euh, eu un rôle assez important, Macron, et on l'a vu à Biarritz, par exemple. À Biarritz, il a fait une manœuvre incroyable, c'est-à-dire qu'il a réussi à isoler complètement Trump de ses conseillers et de ses ministres, 
Ce n'était pas prévu, il l'a pris à part. Il a, Bolton a été éloigné à plus de 200 mètres. Et euh, sans interprète, il lui a parlé pendant deux heures. Et c'est là, évidemment, qu'il lui a confié, il lui a demandé, est-ce que euh, tu verras un inconvénient à ce que j'invite euh, Zarif, le ministre euh, des Affaires étrangères iranien, euh, pour discuter avec lui C'est là qu'évidemment, Trump lui a donné un feu vert. Un feu vert qui était normal, on ne peut pas faire une conférence où le président américain est là et lui a imposé euh, d'inviter ce qui pourrait être un ennemi. Et, euh, et donc ça a marché. Euh, et euh, Macron n'a pas réussi à, euh, faire, à faire la rencontre qu'il a essayé de faire à New York entre le président Rouhani et le président Trump, le président iranien, mais ce n'est pas grave. Pourquoi est-ce que ça n'a pas marché Parce que Rouhani n'est pas le leader de l'Iran. C'est le conseiller en chef du régime, mais ce n'est pas le leader de, 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 de l'Iran. Le leader de l'Iran, c'est l'ayatollah Khamenei, et Khamenei n'a pas donné l'autorisation à, à Rouhani de faire ce, ce rendez-vous avec Trump. Mais on ne peut pas critiquer Macron là-dessus, même s'il a échoué, euh, parce que, indiscutablement, indiscutablement, la cause de la paix dans le golfe persique a progressé après Biarritz. Personne ne peut pas le nier. Autre, euh, je pense, élément favorable de la politique de Macron à l'égard de Trump, c'est euh, sur la Russie. Je pense qu'il parle avec la, de, de la Russie. Macron a tenté, il tente en ce moment, un rapprochement, de ramener en fait la Russie dans la communauté internationale, dans la, dans la, dans la, dans la, dans la discussion. Je pense que Macron a compris que c'était une folie de vouloir jeter les Russes dans les bras des Chinois, et euh, on va voir si ça marche. Il tient au courant Trump, et c'est très important. Il, va y avoir, il y a eu le, le dîner de Brégançon. Comment va se passer la réunion à Paris euh, du, euh, du format Normandie, c'est-à-dire avec les dirigeants allemands, français, euh, ukrainiens, russes, qui devraient arriver, je pense, en novembre, ou peut-être en, en décembre Est-ce qu'on va avancer euh, sur le dossier du Donbass, c'est possible, puisqu'on a une nouvelle donne avec le président ukrainien Zelensky. Euh, c'est tout à fait possible. Et si on avance sur ce domaine du Donbass, c'est-à-dire que si on règle le Donbass, on avance vers un règlement du Donbass, qui est une solution pas assez facile. Amnistie, autonomie culturelle, mais pas autonomie politique du Donbass. Voilà, c'est ça le deal. Si on arrive à avancer là-dessus... Euh, on pourra peut-être envisager euh, une discussion entre les Européens, les Américains peut-être, et surtout les Européens et les Russes sur le Moyen-Orient. Parce qu'évidemment, euh, l'affaire syrienne nous montre qu'on a besoin d'une coopération entre les Russes et euh, les Moyen-Orient. Voilà. Et donc, euh, est pour, pour finir, pour conclure, quelle est la situation en Amérique aujourd'hui La situation en Amérique, c'est que Biden est mort. Sa candidature est morte, tout le monde l'a compris, à cause de, 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 de Hunter, de son fils. Donc, Elisabeth Warren est en train de monter. Not everybody would agree with that. OK. <rire> bah, je donne mon interprétation, puis l'année prochaine, tu pourras me dire que je me suis trompé. Je donne mon interprétation. Elisabeth Warren est en train de monter, mais comme elle a des idées extrêmement à gauche, semble-t-il, notamment, je crois qu'elle a proposé récemment de supprimer le, le corps des... Des, euh, des gardiens des frontières, en quelque sorte américaines, ça va être assez facile à Trump de faire une campagne dirigée contre elle avec un seul slogan, et il n'en suffit pas de, de, de plus, qui sera euh, « Poncaotas »,« Poncaotas », c'est comme ça qu'il l'appelle, « Poncaotas » veut transformer l'Amérique en passoire. Euh, ça peut marcher. Et donc, ce que je dis là, c'est que je pense que Trump peut être élu a encore des chances d'être réélu président. Dans ces cas-là, je trouve que Macron a eu raison d'anticiper, euh, euh, parce que si on a encore 4 ans euh, de Trump, eh bien euh, Macron sera là, parce que je pense qu'il a aussi de très fortes chances pour être réélu lui-même, Macron sera là pour faire ce qu'on appelle, et ce sera mon seul mot en anglais de cette session, pour faire ce qu'on appelle en anglais 4 ans de « damage control ». <laughs> But so as you see, as you see, it, <laughs> as you see it, no negative consequences for Macron in the sense that uh, Trump's famous for throwing his friends under the bus. So I mean, 
you know, you, there's been no non, negative consequence? Non, pense, I don't think so. Non, je ne pense pas du tout. Je ne pense pas du tout que, que ce soit négatif sur Macron. Je ne pense pas du tout. Même, même, il y a des gens qui se moquent de lui. Voilà, il a essayé à New York, il a attendu dans un hall d'hôtel, etc. Et alors Et alors La cause de la peine n'est-elle pas supérieure euh, je ne pense pas du tout qu'on puisse lui reprocher. Il fait tout. Enfin, ça serait quand même très grave qu'il y ait une quatrième guerre euh, dans le golfe persique. Euh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a vu les conséquences catastrophiques de la guerre américaine en Irak de 2003. Donc je pense que Macron fait tout euh, pour trouver un deal entre l'Iran et l'Amérique. Le deal, c'est comme l'Ukraine, on sait très bien quel est le deal. Le deal, c'est euh, l'abandon de ce qu'on appelle en anglais les « sunset clauses euh, », c'est-à-dire que euh, euh, l'Iran renonce à jamais à, à, à l'arme nucléaire, mais évidemment, euh, les Américains euh, lui laissent son axe euh, dans les capitales arabes qu'il a conquis, c'est-à-dire euh, Bagdad, Damas, Beyrouth et, euh, et Sanaa, avec peut-être les Iraniens prêts à lâcher le Yémen parce que ce n'est pas très intéressant pour eux. Alors, on n'appellera pas ça un axe, on appellera ça un marché commun, on trouvera un nom un peu plus soft, mais c'est ça le deal. Le deal est, est prêt. Et Macron pense que ce deal peut être atteint et il essaye de l'atteindre euh, avec Trump. Et il a évidemment parfaitement raison. Et de toute façon, d'ores et déjà, Macron a fait progresser euh, la paix dans euh, le golfe persique. C'est absolument euh, indéniable. OK, thanks, Mono. So, Mono, you wrote, if I'm not mistaken, back in 2017, the most worrying aspect of the Trump administration is its protectionist stance. Is that still the case? Do you still feel that way? And what about his criticism of uh, the car companies in Japan invading the United States and the threat to impose tariffs yeah. on the car mm -hmm. companies and that sort now, of thing. Before we just answer to your question, we have to distinguish two things. One thing is the just result of the Mr. Trump's action, we are just observing what we are now here. But at the same time, there must be the reason why Mr. Trump was elected as president. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about why he was elected and he is doing this kind of business. And that is very much related to what I talked, the trilemma among three things. One is globalization and national sovereignty and democracy. Now, when we have a more globalization, probably we were in what we call the hyper-globalization in the last 20 years. And there's a lot of pressure for democracy to change. And that is what often people call the populism. Mm -hmm. Okay. So actually, Japan was very much used to very severe trade negotiation with the United States for many years. So we know how we should just respond you, to the you, You've adapted to Trump? You've, you've adapted to No, no, politics. just the United States uh, in general. <laughs> but my point is, so Mr. Trump may be populism stage one, mm. and there must be maybe populism in stage two. As long as just globalization is continuing, there's always a pressure for democracy to be eroded by populism. So we have already just heard the name of the Elizabeth Warren, I don't know whether she's going to be the next president or not, uh, but the important thing is whether Mr. Trump is continuing or maybe we have a, some other maybe very leftist, maybe Democrat or whatever, and then we still have to just uh, prepare for uh, the, we have to work on the, uh, the uh, populism. And another thing uh, I want to emphasize is the, uh, when you are facing that kind of a protectionism, the negotiation is often not just uh, uh, go ahead rather than defending your previous position. Now, when Mr. Trump uh, became president, uh, Japan and other Asian Pacific countries were already almost finishing the negotiation of TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Then, unfortunately, Mr. Trump just decided or mentioned the United States is getting out of the TPP. So, the, our purpose is very obvious. One is how we can survive the TPP. And second, how can we, we deal with the United States? And it's a, it, that is exactly the reason why Japan had a, a bilateral negotiation with the United States. And uh, in order to just uh, have you, a... Would you would prefer to have a bilateral conversation than no, a multilateral when, conversation in the framework of the TPP? When it is necessary, uh, bilateral conversation is necessary to survive. Mm -hmm. I mean, like the TPP, 
for us to just finish even without the United States, we need some kind of implicit agreement of the United States for us to continue the negotiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, the TPP result is actually giving us some kind of discriminatory treatment against the United States because other TPP mem members enjoy declining tariff on beef. But that may be a very good weapon for us uh, to just uh, have a deal with the United States that uh, uh, giving us a very similar type of tariff reduction may just have an incentive for the United States not to raise a tariff on the car. So mm -hmm. it is not just uh, forward looking, it's more the defending. Right. But that is a very important part of the, the right negotiation when you're facing protectionism. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it has to be a bilateral, I mean, you're, you're working bilaterally rather than through any kind of an international yeah. organization. So it's a, it's a little bit different. It's difficult for other countries to, uh, to do the, have the same kind of bilateral relationship. Yes, but, sure. uh, yeah. uh, John claude you said a consequential presidency, so why? What does that mean exactly? Uh, let me start by asking the audience and the panel, how many of you are gonna vote at the next presidential election in the United States? Uh. That's the problem, because everybody in this room <laughs> has an opinion who should be the next president of the United States? Well, there may be some non-Americans in this room, so we wouldn't have, Trump wouldn't allow None them to I mean, vote. They've got to have a, let a me proper finish. ID card. What I mean by that, everybody has an opinion who should be president of the United States. Hmm. The bad news is that only the American citizen votes. It takes 60 million people plus, give and take a few, to elect the president of the United States. And the people who are going to vote at the next presidential election, as they have in the past at prior election, are not voting on trade unless it affects their own situation. If they are selling soybeans from Iowa to China, they have a view mm -hmm. on trade. Or if they are from Wisconsin and they're selling milk to Canada, USMCA gives 5% more access, not yet approved by Congress. As you know, this is the new NAFTA or ALENA as you call right. it here. USMCA gives an additional 5% of market access for milk product from Wisconsin, which is a milk state as we all know, to Canada, so th 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 a state which Mr. Trump barely won. So no, but I mean, what I mean by that is that the American people, the American citizens, care about international policy when it affects their own personal selfish interests, or when they belong to a community that's very important and has some influence on the political process. And I'll take two examples, and I won't elaborate on that, the Irish community, we've seen that in the past, and obviously the Israeli community or the Jewish community. And, and that's where you see that they have a view and strong view. Now, why consequential? I'm not trying to run away from your <laughs> question. Well, I, again, I mean, I will give you a few examples, positive, negative, you do it the way you want. I will tell you my own personal view. Uh, I'm not trying to preempt John, but I mean, I agree with deregulation is to me, one a very critical one, and I can come back to that. The other one is the judicial process. We have a country that has a three power structure, legislative, executive, and judicial, and start with the Supreme Court, federal court, and so on and so forth. I have some statistics, we can get back to that, but clearly the judicial process, the number of judicial appointments that have been made since the beginning of the Trump administration is something that's very critical and very important for the Republican Party. The Republican Party don't like Trump. Trump hijacked the Republican Party. They don't like him as a person, but he delivers what they want. So they accept the tweets and they accept the, his personal attitude and a lot of things that they hate because they're getting what they think is essential. And again, I mean, deregulation, because this is good for business, particularly for small and medium-sized enterprise, judicial process. Now, they're also getting a more, and I know we're gonna talk about Turkey and um, uh, Kurds and so on, but there is less and less, and I think this is very much a bipartisan effort, we've talked about it the last few days, there is less engagement, less, the, not the prior panel, but the one before who talks about the Middle East, said there's less engagement in the US. This is not something that's, the Republicans are more interventionist, traditionally than the Democrats, but now Tr Trump. Traditionally, yeah. But, 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 you know, Trump is not a Republican. Trump was a registered Democrat most of his life. When he was not registered Democrat, he was an independent. And you know that at the 2016 primary election in New York, his children couldn't vote because this is what you call a closed primary. 
They couldn't vote because they were not registered Republicans six months before the election. So, I mean, this is the reality. He hijacked the Republican Party. It does not represent the Republican Party, but the Republican Party gets something out of him and they accept the rest because on balance, they feel that they get what's important. But, but, but from your, your standpoint, you would think that, that, that uh, Trump is a game changer when you compare it to Obama. That, that, that his time in office already has accomplished. Not everything, not, ev not everything, but in certain aspects, yes. Definitely, you know, in foreign policy, they are Obama at the surge in, in Afghanistan and so on and so forth. Trump said that he was against Iraq war in 2003. That's not true. But he campaigned in saying, I'm against uh, foreign engagement. I'm not for regime change. And look, and you know, he, he appointed Bolton, but uh, everybody <coughs> knew that it was a mistake and he would fire Bolton at some point. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. And what he's doing now in, in northern Syria is something that's very disturbing for many people from a moral and ethical standpoint, but this is consistent with the view that a lot of Americans, Democrats and Republicans, feel that this is not the role of the United States to settle every international conflict on the other side of the world. The, the, and there's been enormous pushback on that uh, from well, even the Republicans who, no, you know. I, I know that, but there are also people who are, I mean, my, one of my arguments is that one of the uh, consequential aspects of the Trump election on foreign policy has been what I call the defeat of the neocons. The neocons have lost, mm. and that was not obvious. And I think it's a positive thing. And I can continue on that. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Joseph, so you said the plus a chance, plus a so reste la même. So uh, in a way, you two are kind of on different sides of the uh, equation here. You, you, you basically are saying that um, uh, things are basically the same as under the Obama administration, but aren't you? <coughs> or maybe you want to flush that out a little bit. I think it's important to, 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 note, to note these continuities. Um, the, I mean, I'm not going to compare uh, Obama in terms of breach of etiquette mm. and nastiness with, with, uh, with Trump. But um, there, is, um, there is more similarity between them uh, than meets the eye. Three points. Um, Trump keeps threatening allies you, uh, to, to raise defense spending and the threat is you pay up or we move out. Now, that's exactly the line that Obama had in his um, interview with The Atlantic. He said, free riders aggravate me. That's Trumpian speak. And he meant the Europeans, we guys, we protect you and you don't do enough for yourself. Um, second point, recall that it was Obama who drew down troops in Europe to a rock bottom of some 30,000. Um, and so that's part of a general retrenchment. Recall third, that it was Obama, not just Trump, who tried to withdraw forces, American forces, from all over the world, uh, like Afghanistan, then you had to have a surge. But the instinct um, uh, is, is retrenchment, if not retraction. Um, and, um, what is the impetus behind this? That's where more continuity comes in. Uh, one of the oft-repeated lines on the part of President Obama was, it's time for a little nation building at home. In other words, let's take those resources and invest them at home and in infrastructure, what have you. That's exactly the line that, um, that Trump has been pursuing. It's uh, time for spending our wealth, not on these wayward and sometimes disloyal allies, but on ourselves. Um, and uh, so, so you're saying that it's not wait, the content. Wait, that's that's one more thing. Oh, okay. And now if, now, if we shift forward, and that's to me the most interesting part of Korea. I think we are now in the middle, in a, not in a three-year cycle, but in the 11-year cycle. Let's call it retrenchment or retraction. Now, assume a Democrat will win the, the presidency. You'll get the same thing. You'll get 
protectionism at home, you get retraction from abroad, and spending money at home. And remember, that is not a revolutionary thing in American foreign policy. Those of, if you think back some almost 50 years during the Vietnam War, and then I'll stop, what was the famous line with, uh, which McGovern used in his campaign? Come home, America. So that, I think, is the one line that unites Obama, Trump, the Democrat who might come in with it's the tradition that goes back 50 years to, to, uh, to McGovern. In short and in conclusion, we are in a cycle, in a new cycle of American foreign policy, which is older than three, the three years of Trump. And so it's, it's, the content hasn't changed, but the, but the presentation has changed under Trump. The presentation? Yeah. Oh, the style, of course. Style is... Oh, uh, look, I don't want to talk about the style. I mean, we, don't, we are familiar with Trump's style. I, I'm running out of adjectives right. to describe it. Right. But he's uncouth. He is brutal. Uh, he's nasty. He treats allies worse than adversaries. Uh, should, we, should we go on? We don't need to, need, need to go on. But, and I'll talk about it later when we get to it. Of course, what, what he is doing, unlike Obama, that's very important. He is destroying the framework of American post-war policy. Hmm. And he's turning an old non-zero-sum game, meaning all of us can win, into a zero-sum game. Right. Where I will use my power, my superior power, to screw you, and to my gains are your losses. Yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, Chow, you have had probably the harshest words for Trump. You called him ignorant, stubborn, and unpredictable. <laughs> uh, I don't think I have to ask what you meant by that. I can probably figure it out. But um, let me just play it against the, the current talks going on between China and uh, the United States. Mr. Trump over the weekend said a big deal has just, it's huge, a huge deal has just been reached um, with China. Uh, but you've got some more insight into exactly how big that deal was, right? Yeah. Or is. I, yeah, I want to start talking about the, the so-called mini-deal uh, just reached uh, several days ago. As you uh, point out, um, uh, Mr. Trump claimed it's a substantial or big deal. But please remember, just one or two weeks ago, uh, he strongly claimed he want a comprehensive deal, not partial deal. Everybody know that. But why suddenly change? I, I guess from his perspective, I, I guess it's uh, uh, not difficult to understand. <coughs> his final goal is to be re-elected in 2020. That's his personal final goal. Mm -hmm. Support his goal, there are the two considerations. First one, he wants to solidly fire his base in the Middle East. That's best way is China by criticize strong to China. Second consideration is keep U.S. economy from be weakened from recession. So you look at all of his action, just swing between these two considerations. Sometimes first consideration prevail. Sometimes second consideration prevail. This time second consideration prevail. Why? You look at the figure. Now U.S. economy started to weakening, particularly in manufacturing. Uh, lots of data show that. So that case in the deal, so-called deal, China agreed to purchase annually 40 to 50 billion U.S. agricultural products, which give Trump good reason or excuse he can claim he obtained a victory particularly to his base. But, but he did not get any concessions, major concessions from China, or at least uh, so far we, well, let's just let. We'll let no, no, well, sure, but yeah. I'd like to interject yeah. something on yeah. one of the things he said. Yeah, go ahead. He did, did China make any major concessions as part of this deal? Uh, I, I don't think so. You know, uh, Premier Liu He, I guess uh, in several months ago, uh, he claimed China uh, has a three core concern during the, the trade war. First one is if the deal done, all of the tariff increase have to be removed. <coughs> That's first one. Second one is 
increased purchase from U.S. export have to be reasonable, rational. Third one is the text of the agreement have to be well balanced without holding sovereignty of China or dignity of China. The last one is more controversial. It's more complicated. So in this deal, of course, China didn't give up. He's called the last one called council because that's the part of partial deal, not all of the deal. So I guess both sides uh, do maybe a little bit step forward to have a kind of compromising. Of course, I read some social media in China. Some corner of China feel they're unhappy with the deal. They ask, what benefit for China? China, even without deal, they agree to purchase more agricultural product from US. Only US agree to postpone uh, increase from a tariff from 25% to 30%. Also, during the meeting in White House, uh, Rudd Weiser to chap in by saying, December 15, whether increase or not increase, have not decided. Obviously, US still try to use the tariff as a weapon to continue push China. John mm -hmm. what were you going to say? No, I wanted to say uh, three things. Uh, one, <coughs> when you say that uh, manufacturing is weakening, this is true in certain states. Now, remember, manufacturing is a very low component of the GDP in the United States, which yeah. is an economy largely based on services. So it's relevant in as much as it is in a state that's considered to be a swing state. If it's in uh, Michigan, if it's in North Carolina, or if it's in Wisconsin, Trump will care about. At the same time, you can't say that the economy is weakening because it has been acknowledged, published very recently. The employment figure have never been so good in 50 years. And this is not what the administration says, this is the official statistics. We had the lowest unemployment that we've had in 50 years. And that's what matters at the end of the day. And in the relationship with China, I agree with you that Trump once said, I want a big deal, and he will settle for anything that will help his re-election. So I think we all agree on that. I think we got it loud and clear. He's not hiding it in any way, shape, or form. But the real issue are, as we well know, in the relationship with China, which are real. And Trump has raised these issues, but he's not prepared to deal with them because he's, he knows that he's, he can't deal with them in a relatively short period of time, and that that's not going to help his re-election. This is uh, intellectual property. This is the uh, market access, to, to mention too. This is uh, unbalanced uh, transfer of technology. And so, I mean, we can name it, so we know what these issues are. That's not going to change. But what matters is that if he gets a small deal, and he can say, as I said before, with the milk producer in Wisconsin, look, I get you 5% more, that may shift some electoral votes, and that's all he cares about. I mean, he's not trying to uh, resolve the fundamental problem of the economy and the society in, in the US. He wants to get reelected. Mm. Just let me ask a question, if I may. If we were two broadcasters c commenting on a football game, who won this game? I can either. Nobody win, nobody lose for a minute, for minute year. I That's think my, it sounds my like China won to me, no? Uh, yeah, I guess different people have different uh, view. Why China agreed to do that? I guess two points. One is uh, the way doing that is uh, gradualism, which is a core Chinese philosophy. China understand it's hard to make a comprehensive deal in short term, but gradually to reach someone which will create environment to be uh, promote the further uh, negotiation. One thing I want to point, in the trade war, China is on the defensive. That's very important. Also, you look at all of the fact. You Chinese mean on the defensive government, in the sense that, they, that it was started by the United States? Uh, yes. Also, one thing I should remind, I feel very sorry, not many falling to mention that. Yes, many criticism to Mr. Xi Jinping. Yes. Yesterday lunch, Kevin said that. But Xi Jinping said one word, not very mentioned by many people, particularly in Western. He said, we have 1,000 reasons to be have good, re good relation with US, 
no single region has a worse relation with U.S. That's very important. So general feeling is China wants to make some compromise. That's the first point. The second point, China wants to buy more time. Why? Let high-tech company to find some components made non-US mm -hmm. for export. Let them find more other market. As, as we heard in the high-tech panel yesterday. Yeah. The, yeah. Also want to keep foreign FDI stay as long as possible in China. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be coping. Also, from the survey of uh, American Chamber in Shanghai, so far, also I talked with my friend with that. Not many American companies have already start move out. They keep hold because the cost of moving out is tremendous. But if the trade war stay longer, maybe some of them have to move out. Mm -hmm. While we've been speaking here, John's Queen has been addressing the parliament in the United Kingdom. Now, I haven't been able to watch CNN for the last five minutes, but I can tell you that uh, our analysts, I'm sure, going over that speech with a fine tooth comb to see if there's any hint about the future of Brexit. So the question, and I don't want to bring up Brexit in the middle of this, but Trump plays into Brexit. He encouraged Brexit. He promised, or at least he indicated, that the United States would be willing to make up the uh, trade deficit that it might be uh, after trade breaks off with Europe uh, with the United States, and the United States would make up. Do you have any confidence, John, in that that would happen? Well, I, I don't want to talk about Brexit either. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't think Trump had any influence on the Brexit referendum at all. The original sin was David Cameron's. Uh, and the fault was the British electorates. Mm. Uh, and you can't, you may look for scapegoats, you may want to blame Trump, but he's been a sort of uh, 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 firing up some of the rhetoric, but you can't blame Trump for, mm. uh, uh, but, for that. But, but can you, do you have any faith that the United States is going to make up any kind of trade shortfall that uh, Britain Absolutely experiences? Absolutely not. With? I mean, the, uh, what we're seeing with President Trump is a more nationalist leader. Um, and I take seriously his uh, basic slogans about make America great again. Um, mm. it's, a, it's a false slogan at one level, but it shows what his priorities are. Mm. He is not prepared to do what President Kennedy set out 60 years ago, which was that America would bear any burden and pay any price to defend freedom. Those words are absolutely meaningless to, uh, to uh, President Trump. President Trump wants to uh, create jobs for American workers, make uh, uh, America safe from uh, uh, what he would see as threatening migration, and he can let the rest of the world, um, you know, they can look after its own problems. I mean, I do think, I mean, I, just to go back to the central question about what is Trump's legacy, um, I think it's important, Jean-Claude picked up on this, um, he has been a president who has really helped American business. Um, and he's created confidence in America. Uh, I think if Hillary Clinton had been elected, America would be peering down a recession at the moment because of the lack of investment in America, whereas his growth is falling, but will probably bottom at about 2% in the next, uh, next year or so. So uh, we shouldn't, uh, and all the you know, personal views that Joseph mentioned about Trump, I share entirely, um, but he has done something about the American economy which has re-boosted confidence in American growth, uh, which means that a recession is, uh, is at the very least pushed off uh, and delayed, and certainly is unlikely to happen next year. But so the- why, why engage in trade war? I mean, I agree with that point yeah. completely. Why engage in trade war if we hear, well, we came to a draw here, and if I look at the statistics, yeah. the, the basic point about the trade war, which is to reduce your trade deficit, mm has not happened. Well, it probably has in China, because I think the... No, no, the, the overall. Well, overall, it, 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 well, it, you know, Trump has a very superficial view about trade, and we all know that. And it, it, when he rewrote NAFTA and called it the US-Mexico-Canada agreement, the change in the dial was about 2 or 3%. It was basically NAFTA with a new name. Um, and uh, the substance has not changed uh, very much at all. This is Trump's style. Trump is aiming at domestic American politics rather than actually aiming to change the structure so, of the world. So I've got other I mean, points I want to make. Yeah, so we so don't have to take him seriously, right? Yeah. Sorry? We don't have to take him seriously. Well, you, you do have to take him seriously because he can act in a way 
which is very unthought through. And the, the sort of areas that uh, Renault was talking about, his uh, attitudes towards Iran, his um, uh, relationship with uh, autocrats like uh, uh, President Erdogan, uh, leads to consequences which he simply doesn't understand when he's having these conversations. Um, and uh, uh, those are consequential. I think, actually, I, I would side more with Jean-Claude saying he's a very consequential president, and I would say it's more than the, it's, it's, it's the same. And the reason he's consequential, uh, my third word was damaging. I think his, uh, the damage isn't about individual policies. It's not about relationship with China. It's not about what happens in the Persian Gulf. His approach on deregulation has meant he's unable to do anything to contribute to the international efforts on climate change. He, d he barely believes climate change exists, let alone that it's a problem that America has a responsibility to address. His um, uh, approach on uh, foreign relations uh, risks conflict, and he is largely responsible for what is happening in Syria at the moment. Although one has to say the original sin in Syria was President Obama's for siding with a group on the ground yeah. which was aligned with a prescribed terrorist organization. That sowed the seeds of the problem, current problems with, uh, with Turkey. So it's not all Turkey's fault. Thirdly, the disdain for alliances means that other countries around the world, whether it's uh, uh, Britain, France, and Germany in Europe in our different positions, whether it's Japan and South Korea or Australia, or friends of America around the world, will simply not rely on America in the same way that they did before. They will have to balance those relationships and they'll have to find, uh, they have to be more autonomous for their own defense and security. That may not be a bad thing, but is a consequence of Trump. And then lastly Jim. is the damage to international institutions. Um, Trump doesn't believe in American institutions. He doesn't really believe <laughs> exactly. in the Congress or the Supreme Court or the freedom of the media uh, uh, as an individual. Obviously his party believes in all those things. Um, but he certainly doesn't believe in international institutions uh, like the World Bank and the IMF or the International Trading System. So I think he's very consequential. I think a one-term Trump presidency will do this much damage. I think a two-term Trump presidency will do five times as much damage. Uh, and that's the risk that we face. Okay, now Jim. just hang out of the thought because I want to play off this, what you've talked about, about doing damage. Just say, for instance, a hypothetical world in some other parallel universe that Trump is not re-elected for another term. How much of the damage that uh, John's talking about, how much of that damage is going to be permanent or maybe at least long term? And how much can be recovered by the next president, whoever that might be, within a very short period of time? Well, should I have first? Uh, uh, Joseph has reason. I think there is a continuity in the politics uh, American. It's tout à fait évident et que le style un peu particulier de Trump nous le fait oublier. Mais il y a tout à fait une continuité dans la politique américaine. Je suis d'accord euh, que la grande, la grande, le grand changement, c'est l'abandon du néoconservatisme euh, aux États-Unis, cette doctrine qui considère euh, que la justice ou que la démocratie est plus importante que la paix. Ça, c'est fini. Euh, Aujourd'hui, on est revenu euh, au réalisme metternichien ou kissingérien. Euh, la paix, c'est ce qui est euh, le, plus, euh, le plus important. Je crois qu'il euh, y a euh, un héritage, legacy, comme on dit en anglais, un héritage de Trump qui va rester, qui est très important. C'est quand même le premier qui a dit, il l'a dit à Davos, et personne ne l'avait dit avant lui. Pas un président de la Commission européenne ne l'avait dit. Pas un président américain ne l'avait dit. Il a dit extrêmement clairement, et c'est le premier à l'avoir dit, « Messieurs les Chinois, arrêtez de voler la technologie. » C'est très important. Et il, il, il a, d'ailleurs, un soutien bipartisan là-dessus, euh, avec... Euh, avec euh, et nous avons eu, jusqu'à jusqu jusqu euh, Trump, nous avons eu euh, des présidents américains qui ont été extrêmement, on dit en anglais, complacent, euh, extrêmement euh, indulgents à l'égard de la Chine, y compris Obama. Je veux simplement vous rappeler que quand Xi Jinping est venu aux États-Unis, euh, dans une conférence de presse, 
il a été interrogé sur euh, le fait que les euh, Chinois avaient accaparé les récifs des euh, îlots Paracel et Spartles en mer de Chine méridionale. Et là, Xi Jinping a répondu publiquement, oui, mais il a promis que jamais il ne militariserait ces îlots. Aujourd'hui, nous avons des bombardiers stratégiques chinois avec des grandes pistes et des missiles sur euh, six ou sept de ces îlots euh, qui sont en droit international des terrae nullius, des terres qui n'appartiennent à personne, et euh, la Chine ne reconnaît pas, qui prétend pourtant euh, être attachée au multilatéralisme, ne, connaît, ne reconnaît pas l'autorité ou la décision de la Cour permanente d'arbitrage de l'AE sur, euh, sur cette mer de Chine, sur la possession de, de cette mer de Chine euh, méridionale. Donc euh, ça, ça va être vraiment, à mon avis, euh, l'héritage principal euh, de Trump. Alors, sa politique étrangère, elle est extrêmement simple, et ça a été dit, c'est toute sa politique étrangère, et il reste 55 semaines avant l'élection, ça va être tourné vers qu'est-ce qui peut me faire réélire. Mon argumentation, moi je suis Trump, mon argumentation à l'égard d'un électorat américain qui n'est pas le plus sophistiqué du monde, il faut le reconnaître, euh, il est très simple. Il, est dit, il va dire, grâce à moi, avant on entrait comme dans un moulin en Amérique, avec moi c'est fini. Même si ce n'est pas vrai, peu importe. Le ressenti, parce qu'en politique ce qui compte n'est pas la vérité, c'est le ressenti, les gens diront oui c'est vrai. C'est vrai qu'il a protégé les frontières, il a... Il a, il, a, il a combattu une immigration clandestine. Ensuite, il dira, mes détracteurs pendant la campagne électorale ont dit, c'est vrai, vous aviez des tas d'articles dans le New York Times, de Stiglitz et autres, qui vous expliquaient que si Trump était libre, ce serait une catastrophe absolue pour l'économie américaine. Il dira, non, jamais la situation n'a été meilleure. Et n'a été meilleure pour les classes défavorisées, pour les Noirs et les Hispaniques qui n'ont jamais connu de meilleurs salaires et n'ont jamais connu de meilleurs taux euh, d'emploi. Et... John Claude est euh, shaking his head yes here. I think he's... <laughs> I agree with him. Yeah. Yeah. I agree non, with mais him. C'est la campagne qu'il va faire. Il faut, yeah. faut, être, faut être réaliste. Mais c'est la, la réalité. Voilà. Et la troisième chose, donc il va dire, j'ai été un bon ministre de l'Intérieur. J'ai été un bon ministre de l'Économie. Il lui reste une dernière chose. Faut il faut qu'il montre qu'il a été un bon ministre des Affaires étrangères. Et ça, il cherche, c'est pour ça qu'il cherche un deal, quelque chose qui soit euh, médiatique, qui mmh. peut être vendu, parce qu'évidemment, l'apparence est, est, est tout dans le, dans le Trumpisme. Et alors, il y a l'Iran, c'est pour ça qu'il a été tenté par la proposition Macron à New York. Il y a la Corée, mais euh, effectivement, dans l'exécution, il n'a pas été euh, très bon, et je ne suis pas sûr que les Coréens euh, veulent vraiment euh, un deal. Il lui faut quelque chose. Peut-être qu'il va l'obtenir avec la Chine. Mais il faut aussi que le jour de l'élection, il dit, regardez, je suis aussi un grand diplomate. Et ça suffira, je pense, que ça suffira, s'il arrive à, à réunir toujours ces trois conditions, je pense que ça peut suffire à le faire réélire. So, so a, a future president should preserve some of the things that Trump has done. Uh, John Ford, I, I wanted to say two things very briefly. Uh, and that was first in reaction to what John was saying, but uh, Renaud touched on that. Uh, if you look at the polls, and I don't necessarily believe the polls, all polls are negative and show Trump losing against any Democratic candidate. And his perception from the electorate, again, I mean, if you believe at the poll, and so far ahead of the election, 55 weeks, 55 weeks or so. But is, there's a one element on which is always better, he's doing well for the economy. The Americans, the majority of the Americans said he's doing well for the economy and the job situation has improved. Now, I agree with you, he needs something else. He needs something more. Is he going to get it? That's a big question. But the reality is that, and again, the question is not so much whether he's going to get re-elected on his own merit. The question to me is more, and we touch on that, and, and I agree with you. Uh, I think Biden is toast as we said in America, for, for a variety of reasons. I don't think it has to do with the story of his, of his surviving son or anything. I think it has to do with the perception that 
when people, somebody said yesterday, you need to be 80 years old to be president of the United States now. <laughs> and, and, and I think it's a very good comment. You know, it used to be true for China, now it's unfortunately true for the United States. Mm. So we are in a situation, the people, it was true in 2006, it's not just in the United States. Unfortunately, in modern democracies, we don't vote for someone. We vote against someone. When I voted in 2016, I make no, mis I make no it's not secret, I said it publicly, I voted against Trump and I voted against Hillary Clinton and I voted for a candidate who had no chance of getting elected but, vote, but got four million votes, That's Gary good. Johnson. No, the, my point is that in 2016, seven million Americans voted for somebody else than Clinton or Trump. This time, the question is gonna be we don't like Trump, we don't like these tweets, and I hear it all the time from my Republican friends. But at the same time, they'll look, who's gonna be the nominee of the Democratic Party? Too early to say, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Bernie Sanders has a hard problem, I wish him well. Elizabeth Warren has a good chance of being the nominee. And the Poco Hunters, as you said, and the rest is gonna come out. Mm -hmm. And it's gonna be an easy campaign. And Trump can be extremely nasty and he will be very nasty, and he will get a lot of support for that. So I mean, I'm not saying it's gonna work, but the reality is at the end of the day, people are not gonna vote for somebody, they're gonna vote against someone, and they will say, what's worse, having four more years with damaging consequences? I agree, that's, that's real, and that could be serious. At the same time, do we want Medicare for all, or do we want the Green New Deal? which is something totally crazy. I mean, I believe in the environment, but the Green New Deal, if you have not read about it, heard about it, please study it. We've got to bring Moto into this. Okay. So let, let me just come back to your original question, right. whether there's going to be a change in the international system yeah. with or without uh, Trump. Mm -hmm. Now, first, we have to remember when Mr. Trump started the trade war with China, the main issue was the trade deficit and tariffs mm -hmm. and protection of some industry. But now, the much more important issue you just mentioned, the intellectual property or forced technology transfer. Mm -hmm. And so, not only just uh, Mr. Trump, the many people in the United States is critical against the China. So that may take some more time. And then big question is, when China entered WTO uh, 2001, the size of the Chinese economy was only one over 10 of present size. So in the last uh, two, 10 years, China become very, very big, and big question is, can these two big economy uh, coexist under the present umbrella of the WTO? And this seems to be very difficult. So not only the behavior change of China and the United States, which may be necessary for convergence, but we have to think about more real, realistic international system. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know any very clear picture, but uh, the, that is exactly a point. I mean, the dilemma when you have uh, some kind of uh, globalization, then you need some kind of change of the system in order to su sustain the system. All right, I want to try something. I didn't, it's a little bit of a surprise for you because I hadn't briefed you on any of this, but I think one of the things I'd like to ask you, because you're all very highly placed in your various uh, societies and political systems, what do you think your prime minister or president, what do you think that the, the people around them, the foreign ministers and whatnot, find the most annoying about Mr. Trump? And, and, maybe, and maybe at the same time, the, the thing they find uh, most agreeable about uh, Mr. dealing with Mr. Trump. John, why don't we start with you? You got any idea? Okay, well, uh, the f first thing I'd say is that in terms of the British relationship with America, as, as Joseph would say, 90% of it is unchanged. Mm -hmm. The only thing that gets changed are things that touch the White House. And, and as most of us know who've worked in government, Actually, relatively few issues go to, the, uh, go to the head of government. Most of them are sorted out at uh, a bureaucratic or institutional departmental level. Uh, certainly, the intelligence cooperation between Britain and America hasn't changed at all, despite Trump's unreliability on intelligence and his, um, and his, uh, uh, his uh, degree of uh, disregard or contempt for America's intelligence agencies. So life goes on, and heads of government, they dominate the media uh, you guys got lovely stories uh, out of Trump, but actually life does go on uh, as normal. And the great thing, in many ways, if you want to do regular business with the United States, keep it away from heads of government. Keep it away from Trump. But unreliable would be one of the words you would think of, though. Well, he it, well he, he's unpredictable. He, 
he, he, has, he takes decisions based on prejudices and preconceived ideas. He doesn't try to educate himself. Now, Obama was the opposite extreme. He educated himself so much that he didn't take decisions. Right. Uh, <laughs> but, exactly. uh, but Trump, you get decisions instantly without caring what the, uh, really what the consequences of them are. It's just gut instinct as to what his base is going to, going to welcome. Now, what about uh, Xi? What, what do you think he finds? Uh, the people around him, uh, what do they find most annoying about Mr. Trump? Let, let me uh, first uh, back to the question you ask: uh, with or without Trump, right, okay. is anything sure. you know changing in terms of uh, relation between China and the U.S.? I don't think uh, it will be a substantial change without uh, Trump. As many people say, in, in past two days, there's a fundamental uh, uh, difference between these two countries. So. Uh, only thing may be changing is the focus may be changing um, from trade to maybe human rights or the, the style uh, will be changing. The, 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 the substantial uh, tension, I guess, will be persistent for a long, long time. That's my uh, thing. Um, for Chinese side, I don't think they are very much interested in um, internal uh, politics uh, in the United States because that's something, nothing to do with us. Of course, doesn't mean they don't look up closely. Of course, they don't. Because this trade deal, as you said, is yeah. going to support Trump uh, electorally and domestically. Yeah, they look at the closely, but nothing to do for China mm -hmm. in these kind of things. Right. Can, can I just add a point on the trade deal? My sense in, uh, uh, in American politics is that there's a trade-off for Trump and the Republicans as to whether you go for a short-term benefit of selling soybeans to China or whether you can position yourself politically as being tough on China. And I think Trump is much more comfortable being tough on China in the debate over the next year than he is getting some short-term economic kick because he, he doesn't need that <laughs> short-term economic kick. Um, what he doesn't want is for a Democratic candidate, and whoever it may be, it's far too early, I think, to say who's, who the Democratic candidate is going to be. Um, the, uh, 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 he doesn't want to be outflanked and looks as though he's soft on China <coughs> because that would be electorally damaging for him, including in his own base. Yeah. I mean, uh, except that, you know, as we were been talking about, he is taking a short-term gain on the agricultural deal because yeah, that's, that, the, that's, that's, that's... He, he wants both, not only one. But, but, it, but it's not, he's giving up on fundamental change of China because it's not a, chain, uh, a Chinese economy because it's not attainable. So he's just going for fiddling with the balance of payments and the, and the trade deficit, which will make him look good. Let me shift a little, little, little bit the, you know, the, the discussion. It is quite clear that Trump is the bull in the China shop. And, not, and he's a pretty bad bull because the, the normal bull doesn't know what he's doing because it's by his very weight and strength that he demolishes stuff. Trump loves to demolish the store. Uh, he loves to de demolish and deconstruct the global system the United States built 70 years ago and kept maintaining, which served American interests and it served the, uh, the interests of others too. So here he is rampaging through the, through the, China, China, uh, through the China store demolishing stuff, and what, I, what puzzles, puzzles me is how come there is so little reaction on the part of the rest of the world? Normally, if somebody unhinges the system and exerts brutal power, you would have balance of power behavior. The rest of the world would gang up against the bull to tame him. How come this is not happening? Well, that's a good question. And you know, you see this accommodation being made, and we talk about bilateral agreements as opposed to multilateral organizations and that sort of thing. But there hasn't been that much pushback on a multilateral Europeans. Look level. at the Europeans. Yeah. Yesterday, certainly we're not. Are we rearming? No, no. The share of GDP devoted to to uh, to defense is actually going down again. Uh, are the are the three great powers, France, Britain? and Germany uh, doing something to take up the slack. Well, last year, the, the mighty German U-boat force, consisting of six U-boats, had six out of operation. Uh, and so you can go on and on and on. This is what puzzles me. Why are 
worldwide, I mean, Europe, 500 million people, a GDP bigger than China's, uh, enormous resources. How come, maybe you guys can tell me, how come we don't, Europe doesn't create a counterweight to this raging bull? Well, we'll get, uh, there's one answer to that, Joseph. Okay, of course, there are uh, probably and many. Uh, and, and that is that many of the issues that Trump and Lighthizer have raised with the Chinese are actually shared by Europeans. Oh. The, uh, the, the unlevel playing field for foreign businesses in China, uh, the um, uh, endless state subsidies for Chinese uh, uh, enterprises, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, rapacious demands for technology transfer or for buying up technology. So many of the issues which Trump in his clumsy, rather brutal way is addressing... So he's our leader. Uh, well, it, but, but, he's, but he's not a leader we're comfortable with because we don't agree with his tactics. We don't agree with the damage he's doing to the world trade system. But we do agree with, some of the, with many of the specifics he's raising about China. Just as we, uh, you know, a lot of us agree with his pressures on Germany and Italy and other European countries to raise their defense spending. Um, so he, he fastens on to some relevant issues. And then he, 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 he would naturally just, have support if only he sought that support but he alienates that support uh, because of the way he goes about it. It's just not about China. It's about tons of other things. For instance, freedom of navigation in the Gulf. Uh, so apparently he doesn't pay that much attention to it. He accepts one provocation after another from Tehran. And do we see uh, the French and the Brits and the Germans mount a flotilla to protect freedom of the seas in the Gulf? Well, so that is happening to a certain extent. There are British and French ships there doing no, precisely exactly. that. Yeah, Do you know how many, about how many major surface combatants the two countries have? About two dozen each. Well, uh, uh, and they I, used to have 250. But like it doesn't take much to deter an Iranian attack on a commercial. Really? Uh, 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 if you've got the, you know, we, we've seen that happen. Yeah. Example? Right. See, uh, well, before, the, the, you, um, before we get to John Claude, Renault is here. Okay. And we don't, like, we don't like to stifle his comments because... Si, no, très, très, très. Si, si les Europeans, pour, pour répondre à Joseph, si les Européens ne réagissent pas face à ce que vous appelez la brutalité de, de Trump, c'est parce qu'ils ont aussi quand même, dans l'espace et dans le temps, des modèles un peu plus brutaux que Donald Trump. Alors, dans l'espace, bah, je ne sais pas si on ne peut pas dire que Poutine n'est pas un peu quand même plus brutal que Donald Trump. Je ne sais pas si on peut pas dire, on peut peut-être dire que Xi Jinping est plus brutal que Donald Trump, et dans l'espace, et dans le Les temps, Uyghurs, ils ont quand même l'exemple de George W. Bush, qui était plus brutal que Donald Trump. Donc ça, ça, ça à mon avis, c'est la raison pour laquelle ils ne réagissent pas. Mais n'oubliez pas, on l'a dit, qu'en en fait, Trump, il invite les Européens à réagir. Parce que qui est-ce qui a dit, avant vous, aux Européens, de se, avant Joseph, il y a quelqu'un qui a dit aux Européens de se réarmer c'est Donald Trump. Donc, si vous voulez, euh, voilà la, la réponse à votre question. Pourquoi est-ce que les Européens euh, réagissent si peu Okay, so John, well, okay, very quickly because we're down no, no, into the. No, it's going to be very quick. Uh, on these uh, more fundamental issues with China, I, I think I mentioned it uh, the other day during a Q and A session. Uh, the Cyprus process, which is the Council for Foreign Investment in the United States which is the, uh, all the agencies getting together and approving acquisition by Chinese companies and other parts of the world, but it's mostly Chinese, has been very, very strictly reinforced, strengthened, and so on and so forth. And to the point that now many transactions don't even try to be approved because they know they won't get approved. So this is a way to protect some of the American intellectual properties and, and, against and my, China. My point, Jean-Claude, is the same as happened in Britain, the yeah. same has happened in France and Germany. Right. The European Union is producing a regulation to do very much what CFIUS right. is doing. And Japan has produced the most rigorous right. uh, regulations, more rigorous than the United States, to, pre to prevent but Chinese but ownership of even a small proportion but of Japanese technology companies. But Trump John, is John, right. Trump John is right. sorry, John, to answer on this. John, what the, the problem is the fact that those initiatives are not coordinated. Are not, Unfortunately, are not coordinated. Yeah. Well, and, and we would be more efficient if we were coordinated. That, and that, I take the blame for the Americans. Well, that, 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 is the, that is my point about the damage that Trump has done to alliances, is that you've ended up with a fragmented yes, response to this exactly. problem rather than a concerted uh, response to it. Before this conversation gets any more heated, and I didn't <laughs> pack my bulletproof vest, so I don't, you know, I'm not prepared for this, I sense the audience is um, rested. Um, to, Uh, 
I want to speak for, uh, you asked how many Americans vote. I've been in four administrations and senior positions. I've been in every presidential election since 1964. Uh, a couple of quick points and perhaps you can react to them. Number one, foreign policy won't be an issue at all in the election. Notwithstanding the fact that he's destroyed our alliances, notwithstanding the fact he's the only president who has backed away from at least four and now with open skies, perhaps five agreements for each of predators, it will not be an, uh, an issue. Second point, we have a Goldilocks economy, as you've said, lowest unemployment, growth, we'll have a growth slow now, not a recession, and yet his approval rating is 43%, and it's been between 40 and 43% for three years. Mueller, no Mueller, good economic report, good, no economic report. His disapproval, 55%. Uh, so there is vulnerability there, even with the best economy that we've had. Point number three, nobody's men mentioned impeachment. He will not effectively be convicted, but remarkably, just within three weeks, now 57% of the public, including a quarter of Republicans, support an impeachment inquiry, and 51%, even this early, his removal from office. That won't happen, but it indicates a vulnerability. Fourth, he got elected because he appealed to a base that one, wanted disruption. They were anti-globalization, they were anti-elite, and they were anti-immigrant. And that base is a very loyal base and it will remain loyal. But it is a base of a 40% and not more. Last point, having said that, as Jean-Claude said, elections are binary. And with all of these disabilities, with impeachment, uh, which probably will be voted by the House but not agreed to by the Senate, elections are binary. He's pushed the Democratic Party as he's pushed the Republicans to the right to the far left. If that's the choice, he has a good chance of winning even with all of this. I agree with you 100%. No. I, don't, I don't have anything to add. I agree with you 100%. Can you identify yourself? Yes, I'm, I'm Andres sure. Rosenthal from Mexico. Uh, I wanted fundamentally to add to what all of you have said uh, with regard to our perspective as the neighbor to the South. Uh, we've gone through, from the time Trump came down the escalators in Trump Tower to announce his presidency up until the day before yesterday, a constant uh, bashing of Mexico on the immigration issue, on drug trafficking, the rapist. on the wall, on, on almost everything. And at the end of the day, we now have a president in Mexico who, like Mr. Macron, has decided he wants to have a peaceful relationship with Mr. Trump. Um, he is from the left. It's quite unusual for someone from the left to not use the relationship with the United States to his own advantage, but so far he hasn't. And really the question I would ask any of you uh, is how long can that go on? How long can it go on with Mr. Macron, especially if Trump is reelected? And how long can it go with Andres Manuel López Obrador for the remaining five years of his presidency? Uh, people in Mexico are offended uh, by Trump. They are constantly offended. Yet there has not been any public outcry yet uh, against them. So put this question to one, you. One word on me, mm -hmm. if I may, on this one. As you know, your president wrote to Nancy Pelosi to ask her to put the USMCA on the agenda of the House of Representatives. And she doesn't do it for obvious reasons. And one of the reasons being the fact that the unions are against it. And I know Richard Trumka because I happen to be on the board of United Way and Richard Trumka was the head of the AFL-CIO is against USMCA. So this is again one of the reasons why the Trans-Pacific Agreement was not approved mm. because Unions want some more gold plating. Reno, how long can this love affair with Macron and Trump go on? Je pense pas du tout que ce soit. I don't think it's a love affair at all. Um, I think it is uh, that Macron is pragmatic. As uh, General de Gaulle said, uh, 
vous devez prendre les réalités telles qu'elles sont. C'est ce que de Gaulle a dit en janvier 64, quand il a décidé de reconnaître la Chine. Et de Gaulle n'a pas aimé la révolution révolution ou le grand leap forward. Il n'a pas aimé ça. Donc, je pense que Macron, c'est qu'il faut prendre les réalités telles qu'elles sont. Il faut prendre les réalités telles qu'elles sont. Je pense que la France, pour, en ce qui la concerne, a tout à fait compris qu'elle ne pouvait plus compter sur les États-Unis euh, euh, comme alliés, que ce n'était pas un allié fiable. Elle a tout à fait compris. Elle avait déjà compris. C'est pour ça que Charles de Gaulle avait fait la force de frappe indépendante. Parce que Charles de Gaulle se souvenait qu'en euh, 1940, le président Paul Reynaud avait demandé l'aide des États-Unis dans la guerre que nous avions déclarée au nazisme. Pas, nous avons quand même déclaré la guerre au régime nazi et que euh, les Américains nous ont répondu à ce moment-là « manage euh, ». Et donc, euh, donc, nous avons ça. Mais là, évidemment, nous sommes allés dans des expéditions euh, extérieures avec les Américains, notamment en Bosnie. Euh, euh, là, on ne va plus avoir confiance entre eux, en, en eux. On va avoir confiance aux Anglais, aux Britanniques. On va garder le le format des accords de Saint-Malo et des accords de Lancaster House, c'est très important, c'est-à-dire que... Et d'ailleurs, en Bosnie, ce sont les Anglais et les Français qui sont intervenus en juin 1995, et quand ça a marché, les Américains disent, OK, on vient avec, avec notre aviation. Mais c'est quand, sur Terre, une brigade franco-britannique a commencé à taper les Serbes extrêmement sérieusement autour de Sarajevo que les Américains ont dit, OK, on vient avec vous. Je pense que c'est ce qui va se passer, mais euh, je pense que le président mexicain a tout à fait la bonne politique. Il faut, euh, faut s'entendre. D'autant plus que, si vous voulez, euh, l'Amérique est quand même un pays où il y a des « check and balances », et ça, c'est très important. Euh, euh, les relations entre euh, le Mexique et l'Amérique sont très importantes, euh, elles dépendent aussi du Congrès, euh, elles dépendent des, 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 des sociétés américaines, elles dépendent de beaucoup de choses, de la presse, de, des universités, etc. Et je pense que, euh, je pense que aujourd'hui vous avez un accord commercial, et je pense que j'ai aucune raison de penser que, au cours des cinq prochaines années, les relations entre le Mexique et les États-Unis vont empirer. J'ai aucune raison sérieuse de le yeah, penser. Yeah, I, I, I want to make two comments. First of all, you know, I much admire what Macron is trying to do, but the reality is that Macron has not had any significant influence on Trump's decisions, um, which is a shame, but it's the, it's the truth. Uh, um, uh, the only people who have had influence on Trump are people like President Erdogan, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi right. Arabia, uh, Xi Jinping, who's had a lot of influence on Trump, and Kim Jong-un. He, he is influenced by dictators. He's not influenced by Democrats. So that's the first point I want to make. By all means, Macron uh, carry on. He's, he's carrying a, a, a worthy flag, but let's be realistic, he's not achieved anything. Um, the second thing I would say, in response to Stuart's point about American politics, and he has more experience of this than me, but when I look at back at, at Democratic candidates, when Democrats choose uh, an aged, well-known insider like Hillary Clinton or John Kerry or Al Gore or Walter Mondale, they lose. When they choose a fresh-faced, young outsider not scarred by Washington experience, whether it's John F. Kennedy or uh, Jimmy Carter uh, or Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, they win. So uh, I think Democrats, they, they've got a whole sea of new, fresh-faced outsiders. If one of them manages to come through, I think they'll stand a very good chance. If they stick with the old and bold and boring, like mm -hmm. Biden or Warren, they'll lose. So we'll count that as a vote for Buttigieg. So, um, <laughs> no, I said there's a, whole, there's a whole raft of them. It's not for one person. There's a whole okay. raft of attractive Democratic okay. candidates. From a Chinese perspective, it's well-known Chinese are historically patient, uh, also flexible. So we are used to deal with what happened, uh, what changed, uh, Trump or without, with Trump. Uh, honestly, uh, it was war, uh, one year ago when the war, uh, trade war start. There's a kind of a shock for average Chinese people. They don't know what's going on. But now, one year later, we're used to that. Mm. Uh, 
because we, we understand, uh, we feel tired of that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes increase tariff, some increase delay, so many times. So, so uh, people uh, say, okay, whatever you want, you do it. Uh, th we, th this is exactly what Americans domestically are doing. Oh, there's a kind of an accommodation being made for all the outrageous kind of behavior. You sort of say, well, that's Trump <laughs> being Trump. Mr. Colin Pantegui. Thank you. Uh, two essence that made some of the points I wanted to make. So I'll, I'll focus on, on a refocus on the title of the panel, The Consequences of Trump. I mean, I, I agree with some of the things that have been said. You know, in other words, uh, some of the damage uh, is so big, it had some chain reaction. I mean, when you sow protectionism, you get protectionism. When you sow conflict, you get conflict. Some of the things uh, are structural trends, and there is some continuity. Uh, and some other thing, a few, very few things are, are considered good, like certainly pushing back China and all the things. But uh, I also think that uh, any other president, uh, except perhaps Mike Pence, uh, will be able to uh, reverse some of this damage, uh, certainly uh, on the internal, international <coughs> stage on sort of the international agreement and the multilateral order. And more importantly, and nothing <coughs> hasn't been said here, is that uh, what's happening now uh, within America is extremely important for all democracies in the world, for liberal democracy. The struggle that's going on right now in the courts with impeachment proceeding is extremely important. And if <coughs> Trump is defeated, whether in the polls or <coughs> through impeachment otherwise, or resigns, that will have a tremendous effect for democracy uh, around the world. I'm always uncomfortable when people talk about style. It's not about style, it's about substance. I mean, some of the things he's doing and what you call style is a violation of American values, sometimes <coughs> American standards or democratic standards generally. So I think this has not been uh, <coughs> covered or sort of stated we enough in this panel. We haven't talked about that, and that is one of, the, one of the more important aspects of the Trump era is this whole idea about how, wh what he represents for the image of America and what amid, uh, the image that America has always prom uh, promoted around the world. Over the weekend in the New York Times, Michelle Goldberg wrote a very interesting piece uh, called The Beacon Has Gone Out with the subhead, Once Upon a Time We Spread Ideals of Democracy and Rules of Law, Now We Send Rudy. So, it was <laughs> so uh, let's take about three questions because we're out of time, but, uh, and then uh, see if any of the panel members want to answer them. Okay, over here. We haven't been over here yet. And here, we haven't been here either, so. <laughs> Merci, uh, Leïl Choubi, ancien ministre uh, algérien. Je, je voudrais, il semblerait que l'humour ne soit pas interdit, et donc je voudrais poser deux questions. La première, est-ce que la relation internationale se résumerait éventuellement à une question d'ameublement, table ronde, table rectangulaire, une chaise en plus, donc pour la Chine, et ça serait le grand, dé, le grand débat Ou est-ce que derrière ce débat-là, il n'y a pas un plus important qui est un problème de grande recomposition des tendances qui viennent On a parlé de l'Inde, on a parlé de l'Iran, on a parlé de la Turquie, on a parlé du Brésil. Le lendemain de la Première et de la Seconde Guerre mondiale, l'Europe s'est totalement refaçonnée, il y a eu une nouvelle Europe. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas de nouveaux mondes qui viennent Est-ce que le débat sur la recomposition n'est pas d'ores et déjà là La seconde question, très souvent un scénariste qui fait des films, est préoccupé d'avoir des Oscars pour son acteur principal, mais en même temps, il n'aimerait pas qu'il lui focalise toute l'attention et qu'il étouffe le scénario du film. Donc, il essaie de répartir entre le personnage et le film. Est-ce qu'on n'abuse pas trop de l'analyse sur les états d'âme du président Trump Est-ce qu'en fait, il n'est pas révélateur de recompositions qui viennent à l'intérieur des États-Unis, à l'intérieur de l'espace des alliances, puisque... On l'a, ce n'est pas le cas du panel, le panel l'a un peu évoqué. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une grande recomposition qui est demandée Les États-Unis, comment évaluent-ils, euh, euh, avec leurs alliés, la relation en Afghanistan, en Irak, les questions économiques, la globalisation Et donc, est-ce que le maître mot de ces deux questions n'est pas le débat de la euh, recomposition Et est-ce qu'on peut nous éclairer sur les recompositions qui viennent Parce que la crainte, c'est qu'on on, on multiplie le débat sur le hier ou le costume de, 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 de Trump, alors que derrière lui, il y a une réelle de, demande, il y a un électorat, il y a une vision, on l'a vu, pour le démantèlement, les instruments. Mm -hmm. Je vous remercie. 
Good question. Why don't you just pass the mic right there? That's perfect. Thank you. Euh, merci beaucoup à tous les panélistes pour cette discussion extrêmement riche. Euh, je voudrais rebondir sur l'intervention de Renaud Girard parce qu'elle me semble, en, en dépit de tous les apports qui, sont, qui ont été apportés par tout le monde et grâce à eux, euh, la plus prospective. Thierry de Montbrial nous a mis sur une douzième édition qui est sur le global governance. Ma question c'est, dans le cas où M. Trump est élu, qu'est-ce qu'on peut envisager comme ligne tendancielle, grande ligne sur l'évolution du monde. Euh, si on a compris que Trump, je ne veux pas le ramener à ce phénomène-là, parce que le, le, le phénomène Trump est au fond un phénomène, un succès d'année de politique électoraliste où la politique étrangère joue un rôle secondaire. Ce qui est important, c'est Lexington, Kentucky. Ce n'est pas Beijing, China. Donc, euh, on, on vise un public interne. Alors, comment on peut envisager quatre autres années de, 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 de M. Trump dans le cas où il est réélu. Moi, je vois une régionalisation accélérée du monde, où chacune des régions serait laissée à son, son sort, hein, des communs, c'est-à-dire quel type de... de, de Est-ce que les droits de l'homme tiennent encore Est-ce que l'OMC tient encore Quels sont les, les, Ce sera la fin du système multilatéral tel que nous l'avons connu depuis 1945 et troisième grande question, on le voit un peu avec euh, l'incursion, comme dirait Volker, de, de, des troupes euh, turques en Syrie, quid de, de la gestion de crise Quid de, si le, le, le Conseil de sécurité ne fonctionne pas, est-ce que la violence internationale laissée à elle-même ne pourrait pas conduire à des dérapages majeurs voilà. euh, Donc, qu'est-ce qui peut se passer en termes de gouvernance globale dans le cas d'une réélection du président américain. La question aurait pu être aussi intéressante de savoir si, le, dans le cas d'un nouveau d un, d un candidat euh, qui aurait réussi et qui ne serait pas M. Trump, qu'est-ce qu'il adviendrait aussi de la possibilité de revenir sur une politique américaine, laquelle Merci. Nous devrions avoir un workshop sur quel genre de monde nous voulons designer. Je pense que c'est. Merci. Oui, il y a une question là. Yes, to keep on Renault's remark, uh, I may ask our Japanese, German, and uh, British friends, what does being allies entail uh, after these years with the uh, Trump administration? We're supposed to be allied. What does it mean, actually, for each of your countries and on your analysis? And actually, how does NATO stand now? Would Renault say NATO still exists or not? And the others. What is <coughs> it being an ally with Trump administration? Okay, let's start there and uh, answer any of the questions you've just heard, uh, any of you. But Renaud, why don't we start with you because that was the last question. No, I think it's absolutely evident that there is a recomposition. What is it? Well, there is a grave weakening of the whole system multilateral, which had, of course, defects, but which had quite a lot of qualities constructed euh, par les Américains euh, en 1945, et Laurent Cohen-Tanuji en, en a dit un mot, euh, et même quand euh, ça peut lui servir dans sa lutte contre la Chine, il ne l'utilise pas. Donc il y a une, une haine, euh, chez, chez, ou une incompréhension, c'est plus qu'une haine, c'est une incompréhension du, multi, du multilatéral chez Trump, sans doute d'ailleurs parce que dans le real estate à New York, euh, le, multi, le, le, le multilatéral, ça n'existe pas. Et donc, euh, voilà. Mais il y a d'autres, monsieur le ministre, il y a d'autres compositions euh, qui, va, qui, 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 qui ont lieu déjà. Il y a quand même une sorte d'alliance stratégique qui se poursuit entre, enfin, qui, 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 oui, qui est importante entre la Russie et la Chine. La Russie vient annoncer il y a trois, trois jours qu'elle allait mettre au point, euh, aider les Chinois à mettre au point euh, des missiles antiaériens plus, plus performants. Euh, il y a aussi un axe dont on n'a pas parlé, euh, qui est en train de se construire, l'axe washington euh, Delhi, avec, vous avez vu, la réception qu'a fait euh, et le discours qu'a fait Trump euh, à, lorsque Modi est venu euh, au Texas. Euh, donc, on va avoir cette... Euh, est-ce que... Alors, la question, la question euh, nous a été posée, est-ce qu'on peut avoir de grands dérapages Est-ce que ça conduit à de grandes guerres je ne pense pas que, je pense que cette, euh, cette, euh, cette mise en cause du système international, du FMI, de l'OMC, etc., est dommageable, c'est évident, mais je ne pense pas qu'elle est suffisante pour provoquer 
deux grandes guerres, et je vous rappelle quand même que, euh, que euh, le système inter international qui euh, fonctionnait extrêmement bien, même avec des idéalistes comme John Kennedy, euh, John Soros a cité John Kennedy, ben John Kennedy, au même, au même moment où il était très idéaliste et où il disait, voilà, euh, je combats pour la liberté, etc., il a quand même provoqué une catastrophe qui est la guerre euh, américaine euh, au Vietnam, qui a mis un chaos dans toute l'Indochine euh, pour, pour, pour très longtemps. Donc, euh, en fait, euh, ce n'est pas parce que vous avez un système onusien, euh, le système onusien ancien n'a pas empêché les, 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 les soviétiques d'envahir l'Afghanistan en euh, 1980 et n'a pas empêché les Américains d'envahir l'Irak en 2003. Donc, voilà, recomposition, oui, Dommage euh, de tout ce que nous avons construit euh, euh, sur euh, la, la gouvernance internationale, euh, oui. Grand conflit à venir, non. Je, je n'ai pas d'éléments euh, pour dire qu'on va vers de grandes guerres. Et même, je pense que les histoires en mer de Chine, euh, en mer de Chine euh, euh, méridionale, où en fait les Américains ont perdu la guerre, les Chinois ont déjà gagné, hein, euh, je ne pense pas qu'on ira vers la guerre. Je ne pense pas non plus qu'on ira vers une guerre euh, entre le Japon et la Chine. Si, évidemment, Xi Jinping avait la folie de vouloir reprendre Taïwan pour des raisons intérieures, là, on aurait une très grande guerre, parce que les Taïwanais ne vont pas se laisser faire. Ensuite, évidemment, les Américains interviendraient dans la, dans la guerre. Mais aujourd'hui, je pense que Xi Jinping est suffisamment sage pour ne pas vouloir reprendre par la force Taïwan. You can see why Renault is such a frequent guest at uh, Radio France Internationale. Um, the, <laughs> you fill the airtime, as we say on CNN. Um, so any last thoughts, because we really are out of time, on the evolution of the world? Is it going to be evolving as a multilateral, unilateral? Is it going to be liberal democracies versus autocracies? Jean-Philippe, so close. What worries me more than anything else is the polarization of American politics, because a lot of questions have been asked what's necessary to sort of fix problems. And to fix problems, you have to have a consensus. Historically, there was a consensus on basic foreign policy. There was a consensus on fiscal discipline. There was a consensus on certain policy of immigration. There was a consensus on certain free trade. We don't have that anymore. So the only way to achieve that is probably to forget about this next election, which is not going to solve anything, and hoping that There is a majority of people in the United States, I believe, who, who are, what I would say, fiscally conservative and socially liberal. And what I mean by that, I mean they are, there's probably now a majority which is pro-choice and not pro-life. And as you know, Trump has used extensively the pro-life movement to get elected. I mean, somebody yeah. mentioned Vice President Pence. And on that sense, Pence would be worse than Trump. Yeah. Something that you have to keep in yeah. mind. That's one example. So uh, my point is that there is a hope. There is a hope that, but the fiscal discipline is the most important thing. The, the debt is 23 trillion. And the, def and the deficit, you know, the, we have a situation which is untenable. Entitlement, Medicare, Medicaid is 64%. In 2040, it's going to be more than 100% of GDP. Right there is a consequence of uh, Mr. Trump that's going to go on beyond his presidency. Joseph, we have to get you in here yeah. and talk. Quickly, this, you know, we've described how Trump is demolishing the global order. This should have been the, the hour of Europe because we in Europe for the last 70 years made a living off the liberal global world order, <coughs> trade, openness, capital movements uh, that the United States built and maintained. So. Europe should, in its own interest, step up. But I've never seen, I don't, you know, I've been around for a while, but I've never seen Europe so much in disarray as it is right now. If you look at the three major powers, yeah. Britain is kind of out of the game. Macron, for all his posturing on the international stage, which he does very elegantly, is beset by almost uncontrollable forces at home, which are hounding him. And, and threatening to demolish his reform program. And then, of course, there is Germany and Mrs. Merkel, who used to be the uncrowned empress of Europe. And she was so celebrated for so many years, you know, the empress of the Holy Roman Empire, you know, the, the, the EU. And, 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 and there is no, lo no longer any Mrs. Merkel. 
and there is no successor of any weight in sight. And we're not even going to talk about Italy. Um, and then if we add the division between the neo-populist nationalists in the East and the more or less liberal uh, uh, societies in the West, Europe is really in bad shape. And we haven't, we've spent pretty much the whole morning talking about Mr. Trump without talking about what is closer to, well, should have been closer the, to the, the, the subject of the panel, yeah. so that was, what? it was the subject of the panel. So I know, come on. But, but you know, you can't talk about Trump without talking about that 70-year-old alliance which kept the two of them together. John, I, I, I would just say a, a, a couple of concluding remarks. First of all, the, I, I fully agree, the American election will be determined by American voters operating on American domestic interests. Well, For the last 70 years, the opinion. global system has been run by the elite. The elite in America, the elite in Europe, mm -hmm. and the elite in other countries. We've managed that global system. We now have in the White House someone who's straight out of propping the bar up in the local pub uh, with views that are commensurate with, uh, with someone who's simply not just not part of the elite, but anti-elite. Mm -hmm. um, so that is why I, mean, I, I welcome your optimism that a future leader will be able to get back to normal. I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm certainly not sure about it if Trump wins a second term. And I also share the concern about this violent oscillation in politics. Um, and if, if uh, uh, America is presented with a choice between sort of Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon as their next leader, where will normal people go? Where will they go in France? Um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I think we should remain optimistic. We as the part, uh, everybody here is part of the global elite. We need to do what we can to preserve the system whilst we have a, a, a barroom bully uh, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the White House. Um, but we should be very careful to be uh, cautious about thinking uh, that this is just a passing storm and it will all get back to normal again when the man goes. He is doing serious damage to the international system. There, there's there's okay. evidence of that everywhere around the world when you look at the other sort of mini Trumps. Cal, yeah. last word. My uh, final conclusion or final remark is the rise of China uh, created two tremendous challenges. First one is challenging to the global uh, order, whether the rest of the world, particularly the Western country, allow another big economy with different uh, social system, but not directly change or challenging or deny the lifestyle of other country. That's first challenge. Second challenging to China itself, how you correctly summarize your experience for your successful, economic successful. How do you follow the title of a word, which is uh, democracy, marketization, internationalization? That's two questions, I guess. It's very tremendous. So I know you're all hungry for our brilliant knowledge, but you're also probably hungry. So um, I would say that's the concluding of the panel, and thank you very much for attending. Great.